It's summertime at the Circuit de la Sarre. The year is 1991. It's the 59th running of the 24 Hours of Le Mans Endurance Race, a non-stop battle between the world's best drivers and manufacturers to see who brought the best car for the all-day contest. Flying down the legendary Molson Strait is a new type of prototype race car. Unlike the more traditional sports cars turning laps, this prototype looks more like a spaceship than a consumer car. The noise it makes is otherworldly too. The car is the Mazda 787B, a future cult classic, dressed in an iconic green and orange paint scheme. Despite the 217 mile per hour top speed, the Mazda is not the favorite to win that year, not by a long shot. So why is this car so legendary? Well, we're gonna find out today on Pass Gas. Wow. Ooh, I'm pumped. <laughs> wow. After that? Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. Oh if my there God. was an Oscar for intros to podcasts, you would be at least nominated. <laughs> but Rob. <All> right. <laughs> but Rob. I appreciate that. Yeah. No, right. I mean, oh, we'll Joe Rogan won again. Yeah. We'll, we'll lose to um, uh, Romeo and Juliet. But. <laughs> That was definitely the saving uh, part, Ryan. We lose to the dollop. Ah, <laughs> shoot. Romeo and Juliet like was a dollop. beautiful movie. I mean, what? you like Boz Lerman's it was, uh, it Romeo was, and Juliet? It was certainly more, uh, certainly a more innovative take than old man war movie. <laughs> All right. Well, that's a fair. Point. I think Saving maybe Private. Maybe I think Saving Private Ryan's a really good movie. Um, I, I, I think the funniest part of Saving Private Ryan is when I, I may have mentioned this before, but when uh, Matt Damon's character is like old and he's going to the National Cemetery, um, yeah. his, he's got three granddaughters and they're just freaking dimes. Like they are the <laughs> hottest girls ever. And they're all like holding hands. Like they're all like arm in arm. They're just like, they were like. So they realized, I, oh no, there's no women in this entire movie. <laughs> we better find the hottest one we can find. I went to the castle that Romeo and Juliet was filmed at in Mexico. It's in the in this huge park that's like twice the size of Central Park in the middle of Mexico City. And there's a hill and there's this castle on the top of it, and it's just as cool as it looks in the movie. Great. Well, uh, I guess I'll rewatch it because the last time I saw it was freshman year of high school. So I'll check that out tonight after this podcast. Speaking of which, today we are doing part two of our Rotary series here on Pass Gas. I am Nolan Sykes, your host as always, with my buddies in arms, one Mr. James Pumphrey. I wish I was your buddy in your arms, baby. <laughs> More power, baby. <laughs> Which is weird. And Joe Weber. Uh, wink, wink. No oh, fire up wink, today. Wink. I mean, I'm trying out new stuff, but I feel like I'm getting a resurgence in my DMs of Wink, Wink Nation. So I feel like oh, I should yeah, lean wink, into wink. that. Um, what's up, Wink, Wink Nation? You guys, I wouldn't be anything without you guys. Thank you. I'm gonna start. I'm gonna try a new one. Okay, intro okay. me again, Nolan. With me, as always, my co-host, James Pumphrey. Look at that dog over there! <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> little little uh, animal-themed spay and new to your pets. Go adopt a dog today. Very nice, James. That'll go I'll well with our big dog uh, collaboration. Collab, yeah. Oh, yeah. I can't wait for the big dogs. Okay, intro, intro me again. All right, again? Mm -hmm. uh, as as always with my co-host, James Pomfrey. Burr, it's getting cold in here. <laughs> oh, the big bopper's <laughs> back, and he's cold. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, we have options. That's 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 the takeaway here, <laughs> okay, James. One I more, think one you, more. there's still... One more. Okay, yeah. and my co-host, uh, James Pomfrey. This baby tastes like cake frosting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know how to misconstrue that. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So a lot of options for you, James. I think you can keep innovating the slogan game as you have been for the past three years here at Donut Media. Mm -hmm. Fired up. All right. 
Nice. Fire it up. Let's go. See, that one felt unforced and really great. <laughs> that felt really good. Nice. Bird, it. It's getting cold in here. <laughs> <laughs> When we last left off, we discussed the release of the Mazda Cosmo. As it turns out, the Mazda Cosmo was going to be a pretty big deal for the company. The little 110 horsepower, delightfully different sports car was Mazda's way of shouting, I'm different, Dad, as they forged their own path in the sports car market. <laughs> The Cosmo Sport was a tribute to the thousands of hours that they had dedicated to perfecting the rotary engine and creating a car that was truly special. The production only lasted five years at a rate of about one car per day, which means there were only 1,176 Cosmo Sports on the road at its peak. But that didn't matter, as it was truly meant to be the company's halo car. It was meant to show people that unlike other companies, Mazda wasn't ready to give up on the Winkle rotary engine just yet. They were dedicated to commercializing the strange engine and hoped to push their company to the top in the process. I do remember driving the Mazda Cosmo uh, uh, Sport in one of the Gran Turismo games, and I do remember it being pretty good, actually. Uh, so that means it was definitely really good in real life. That's how it works, guys. Uh, I just bought a Veloster N in Forza Horizon 4 um, after just driving it in real life. And it was it was very analogous to how it felt in real life. So good on those engineers. I could definitely daily one of those things. I really, really enjoyed it. It's fun. Speaking of successfully commercializing their engine, Mazda certainly wasn't the only company trying to push the Winkle rotary engine into the spotlight. After the initial release of the rotary design, everybody wanted to get their hands on one of Felix Wankel's little beauties. In all, about 23 companies licensed the technology from Wankel and Audi NSU. Rotary engines are light and relatively easy to work on, as James was saying, if you know what you're doing. The low power to weight ratio of the design made low the de power, baby. <laughs> low power, baby. In in the language of Yoruba, which I, I have never heard of, means uh, I am big. Uh, <laughs> Hell yeah! Duh, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, it means something. How, yeah, language? how it's spelled, like how we spell it: M O P O W A H B A B E H. Yeah. yeah, I guess is in Yoruba means I I am big, and it. That's what, what is it Yoruba? To. I've never heard of Yoruba. Yoruba is the name of the language. Yeah, uh, someone in our subreddit found it out. Okay, it's a ethnic group that inhabits Western Africa, mainly Nigeria, Benin, Togo, and part of Ghana. The Yoruba constitute about eighty-eight million people within Nigeria and over one hundred twenty million worldwide. So, if you are Yoruba, um. Thank you so much for listening to the show. Mo power, baby. <laughs> to you. Mo power, baby. I'm so big. <laughs> Did you? I'm so big. Wait, are you still on translate right now? Oh, it in Javanese, it says, it means you are a babe. <laughs> wow. So Mo power, baby. Lots of meanings spread across the world. Thankfully, all of them positive. I would hate for it to be a, a, a hateful <laughs> slogan so anywhere big. else. I'm so big. When we finally do a world tour and we go to Nigeria, it's going to be great to um, scream that into a microphone. All right, so the low power to weight ratio of the rotary design made the idea of using the engine very enticing to a lot of companies. The people at General Motors were definitely interested in giving the rotary a lot of consideration. John DeLorean and John DeLorean and Ed Cole looked at the design and were like, yeah, that's pretty sweet. We could probably do something with that. Like, yeah, I'd like what? to do a rail of Coke off of that bad boy. <laughs> and they did. Well, I don't know about the Coke part, but they, they looked into it. John DeLorean had just helped to develop the Chevy Vega, which uh, was a good and bad car for the company. Millions of Chevy Vegas were sold, which was unfortunate for the company as they all had huge reliability issues, meaning that Hundreds of thousands of people had a bad experience with the car. I think we discussed this in our DeLorean series. I think the Vega had it had bad cooling issues, so a lot of cars would overheat. But this could have been different if the General Motors Rotary Combustion Engine Project, or GMRCA, had been successful. 
During the peak of the initial rotary craze, GM had licensed the design of the Vankel rotary engine. It was actually pretty cool. Their little 3.38 liter twin rotor engine could run over 500,000 miles in testing before any considerable engine wear took place. But to meet new emissions laws, the overall fuel economy suffered greatly. Despite their claims of running over 500,000 miles without failure and testing, in practice, the Apex seals would still fail prematurely after hard testing. After throwing about $50 million into the project, Oof. GM President Ed Cole finally canceled it, resigning from his position one month later. <laughs> okay, not only, uh, okay, this is a terrible idea. Uh, you don't have to fire me. I quit. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I think he's probably pressured from the board to do that. But the GM rotary was nowhere near as cool as the four-rotor diesel rotary designed by Rolls-Royce. That's right. Hell yeah. Rolls-Royce was in yeah, this is going to this this one is crazy. Yeah. Uh, Rolls-Royce was interested in rotaries for reasons that you wouldn't exactly expect from the company. You would expect them to be into the rotary because of how smoothly and comfortably it ran, but you would be wrong. Dead wrong, pal. Dead wrong. Yeah. You thought you were right. Guess what? Dead wrong. I'm here to tell you you weren't. You'd be half right, but you'd be dead wrong. Rolls was actually interested in rotaries for military applications. Sure, rotaries weren't the most fuel efficient, but that didn't matter. After all, no one cares about fuel economy in a Rolls, especially if the government is the one buying it. Six years after they first conceived their design in 1966, they came out with that radical four-rotor layout. Their four-rotor design hinged on having two rotors stacked on top of each other, a smaller rotor on the top and a larger one on the bottom, both connected with pressure passages. The lower and larger rotor basically acted as a large compressor for the upper rotor, while the upper rotor was in charge of actually producing the power. So it's almost like a supercharger or a turbo or something? Yeah, exactly right. Only four prototypes were produced before the company concluded that it was just too expensive to be practical. The final design by Rolls-Royce made 350 horsepower with an engine that only weighed 425 kilograms. Or in freedom units. I'm going to say 1,031 pounds. James, do you have a wager? 2.2. Whatever 2.2 is. Um, yeah. Um, so that'd be <laughs> 950. And then whatever point two, I'm saying five <laughs> percent of four hundred. So I'm gonna say uh, twelve hundred pounds. Oh, eleven hundred pounds. Uh, the true amount is nine hundred thirty-six pounds. Uh, damn, you're so close with that first one. And also, like that's pretty heavy, I think, for an engine. Yeah. Oh yeah, I didn't even think of that. So that for a a three hundred fifty horsepower nearly half ton engine that's that's a lot so i can see why they didn't go after that but the idea is pretty cool like you said joe it's like having an internal supercharger for better or you know for lack of a better term pretty neat mercedes wasn't far behind in dumping obscene amounts of money into a technology they would never use the mercedes c111 turned heads when it was announced at the 1969 nice frankfurt auto show People couldn't turn away from its dramatic fiberglass body, and most importantly, its mid-mounted four-rotor engine producing upwards of 350 horsepower. Only 16 of these rare dream cars were actually produced, and despite the fact that it came with its own set of matching luggage, it couldn't keep up with rising demands in emissions and fuel economy standards, so the project got shelved and remains an unobtainable piece of history. This car looks so sick. Yeah, it's very cool. I like these things a lot. Yeah. I want one of these. We'll get you one. Thank you. That would be such yeah, a flex. Yeah, when's your birthday? Uh, not till March. That's no, March 19th. I know. It's, yeah. I know what your birthday is, James. <laughs> I know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's mine's a day after yours. Um, you want me to make you some soup? <laughs> Other companies such as Ford and Citroen also tried their hand at the rotary, but in the end, everyone failed. <laughs> it became obvious almost immediately that they just couldn't justify the intense costs of development when it came to creating a brand new engine. 
Mazda was the only company who took a no BS approach to rotaries, basically taking the stance that they would bankrupt themselves if that's what it took to get rotaries into the mainstream market. And they almost did multiple times. Why? Why do they? Why are they yeah. so invested in this engine? That's yeah. what I want to know. It's like uh, Howard Hughes. It's a spruce goose. Mm-hmm. In 1968, Mazda released the Familia Rotary Coupe, also known as the Mazda 808. 808. 808, baby. <laughs> Freaking Hawaii. Shout out 808 State, man. Uh, <laughs> It was also known as the Savannah or the RX-3 or a lot of other things. The car had a lot of names. The car had a lot of names, okay? Uh, it was their second rotary car, and it was intended to be a global strategic car and place Mazda on the radar of drivers everywhere. Unfortunately, a couple of things came up in the U.S. that sort of dimmed the immediate chances of the rotary reaching America and the American market. Uh-oh. Now, in 1963, the U.S. government implemented the first Clean Air Act, which basically gave the U.S. Public Health Service five years to monitor the impacts of air pollution, which they extended. Along with increasing that deadline, in 1970, they passed the Muskie Act. Now, the Muskie Act implemented four regulatory programs regarding air quality, as well as paved the way for the creation of the EPA under Nixon, Oh, which is one I thought, thing that he did right. I thought the Muskie Act... The Muskie Act would make grizzled hunks smell really good. No, that's the Nolan Act. <laughs> oh <laughs> no, that's hey. the that's the Doctor that's the Doctor Squatch Act. <laughs> I I am using that Doctor Squatch Dude, soap. Me too. I my, have used the shampoo. My, I didn't. I don't think I received any shampoo. Mm. No, I might have. It might be in the box still. Yeah, but I have been using. Dude, did you use the pine tar bar? Uh, I don't know. Is that the black one? Is it kind of black? Is one, it yeah. kind of scrubby? Has it got scrubbies in it? Oh, it is. Ex I would actually recommend using that one every other day because the 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 scratchiness of it is pretty intense. <laughs> I I like it. So we have a couple bathrooms. And so we have like our bathroom, and then I have a bathroom to do my oh, poop, big shot to, over here to do my poops in. Um, Dude, so sometimes honestly, it's kind of a prison bathroom. There's nothing in it. <laughs> it's like fluorescent lighting, and it's just like very Soviet block. <laughs> yeah, it's just for my poops, and the only thing in there is the is our million subscriber. Class. <laughs> yeah. um, shout out to I'm, I straight pipes for did they hit a million yet? Uh, by the time this airs, they will have. Cool. Congrats, guys. Yeah, my two my. Two favorite twin influencers. The Dolans ain't got nothing on you. They are the best twins. On, the straight pipes are the best twins on YouTube. Yeah, it's amazing. And are they are they like identical or are they fraternal? Because I always get that mixed up. No one thinks they're identical. I think they're fraternal, but just look almost exactly like. It's hard to tell because Jacob has a beard. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we but. should do an artist rendering to see what he would look like without a beard, and then we can make yeah, our final decision. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's get Max on that. It's time for this week's sponsor, Valvoline Motor Oil. You know the deal by now. Valvoline was the first patented motor oil brand, making them the original motor oil. That's no BS. Since their founding over 150 years ago, established in 1866, Valvoline and their scientists have been innovating, creating, and reinventing formulas for every kind of car. Their innovations include the first high mileage oil, the first racing oil, and the first synthetic blend oil. What more do you want from an oil company? Valvoline is the only motor oil with their own dedicated engine lab where they're able to run specialized tests and standardized engine tests in their own facility. This allows Valvoline scientists more freedom and flexibility to innovate as they have the results right at their fingertips right there. I don't know how other, other I don't know how other oil companies do it, but um, they don't do it like Valvoline, tell you that much. All Valvoline oils exceed industry standards to provide the ultimate protection for every engine on the road, including yours and mine. I've got Valvoline in my car. So thank you very much, Valvoline, for sponsoring this episode. Get some Valvoline in your car today. All right, back to the episode. All right, it's time for a bit of a science lesson, all right? When you burn fossil fuels, the fumes in the exhaust contain a bunch of different gases ranging from carbon monoxide 
nitrous oxide, and a whole bunch of polycyclic hydrocarbons and a couple other miscellaneous chemicals. In a perfect world, the only byproduct of burning fuel would be CO2, carbon dioxide, and water vapor. But that would require 100% efficiency, which, unfortunately, is impossible. So, instead, we end up with these more harmful byproducts that result from the incomplete combustion of fossil fuels. What the Muskie Act really focused on was the amount of hydrocarbons being thrown into our atmosphere. Hydrocarbons are considered the driving force of modern civilization as they make up fossil fuels and are the most widely used organic compound on the planet. The recipe for a hydrocarbon is dead simple. In fact, it's in the name. You need a carbon bonded to a hydrogen and that's it. The most simplistic form of a hydrocarbon is methane, but the more complex form called aldehydes is where life gets interesting. Aldehydes are a byproduct of burning fossil fuels, which means that the incomplete combustion of hydrocarbons in vehicles is a major source to blame for directly pumping aldehyde emissions into our atmosphere. In 1969, people were finally determining that aldehyde emissions were a thing. What wasn't discovered until years later was that the presence of these aldehydes in our atmosphere directly contributed towards the greenhouse effect, helping warm our planet and destroy the native habitats of animals around the world as the heat from the sun is trapped inside of our atmosphere because of these emissions. The Clean Air Act made companies who were in the past free from such regulations responsible for what they were putting into the world, and that was a bit of a shock for them. Engines that had been tuned for power didn't exactly take emissions into mind, and the cheapest and easiest way to get by the new guidelines was to simply detune these engines so they burned less fuel. But for Mazda and their rotaries, that wasn't exactly possible. There just wasn't that much room to detune the rotary without causing it to cease function altogether. The new regulations basically killed every other company's desire to go near the rotary engine, but Mazda was dedicated, and what? they pushed through why? looking for... <laughs> they... <laughs> because it's hard. It's hard to make them clean. I know, but it's why was Mazda it. dedicated? Mazda's like in an abusive relationship that it won't leave. <laughs> you said it, brother. But Mazda was dedicated, and they pushed through looking for new ways to innovate and advance their rotary technology so they could keep up with their competition and sell their cars on the U.S. market. So, how did they do it? Well, Nolan, I'm, gl I'm glad you asked. Mazda introduced a thermal reactor system into their exhaust. It was sort of a last resort measure for the rotary as it sacrificed fuel economy and increased production costs. Basically, a thermal reactor uses rerouted high temperature exhaust from the engine to burn off excess hydrocarbons that are formed during incomplete combustion of fuel in the engine. The downside of this technology is that it took a long time to heat up completely to be effective and the thermal expansion of the parts heating and shrinking each time the car was started meant premature failure often happened. Mm. While it wasn't the best solution in terms of practicality, it was exactly what Mazda needed to get into the U.S. In 1973... It sounds almost like a... Sorry. It sounds almost like a primitive kind of catalytic converter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's exactly, in a way. Exactly. Normal. Same principle, different operation, it sounds like. Yeah. In 1973, Mazda finally passed the emissions test. Everything was looking perfect for the Mazda rotary. The Mazda Luce AP, which stood for anti-pollution, passed with flying colors and was given preferential tax treatment for such low emissions. Unfortunately, Mazda immediately hit another roadblock. This time it came in the form of the oil crisis. Guys, oil crisis merch coming soon. The 1973 oil crisis was due to an oil embargo on nations perceived as supporting Israel during the Yom Kippur War. Arab oil production, producing nations used oil as a weapon of political influence to help dissuade nations from supporting their enemies. To meet the strict emissions demands at the time, Mazda had basically destroyed the fuel efficiency of their rotary lineup, giving them the label of gas guzzlers. Whoa. The oil crisis almost brought the rotary engine to extinction. After all, no one was going to buy a car that used a ton of gas when you couldn't even buy gas in the first place. So Mazda decided to kick off Operation Phoenix. Ooh, Operation, cool name. Yeah. Operation Phoenix committed itself to improving <laughs> the fuel efficiency of the rotary by 40% within five years, effectively reviving the project and bringing it back to life. 
Within two years of nonstop work by a dedicated team of engineers, the efficiency of the engine was improved by 20%. Shortly thereafter, an innovative breakthrough utilizing excess heat from the thermal reactor led to the development of a head exchange program. As a result, the efficiency of the engines was improved by 50%, which was 10% higher than the original goal, all within four years. The Mazda RX-7 wow. premiered at the Las Vegas Motor Show in 1978. The name stood for Rotary Experiment 7, because it's not an experiment if you use the E. <laughs> That's right. With styling cues borrowed directly from Lotus, the RX-7 was hoping that getting their foot in the market would help them compete with their Japanese counterparts, such as the 280Z or the Toyota Celica, as well as bring a sporty car to the American market that Americans might actually want to drive. I love this generation of RX-7. So, I think yeah. it's so cool. The rotary engine was placed behind the front axle in its, quote, front midship rear drive setup. That's right. It's actually, it, is a, it is a proper mid-engine car because that engine is behind the front axle, which gave it a great center of gravity and weight distribution. The 7,000 RPM redline was reminiscent of race engines and gave drivers the sporty feel they had been dreaming of. How often do you get to drive a car that the manufacturer specifically tells you to drive the sh** out of? Mazda encouraged their customers to shift at redline. That way, any carbon deposits could be cleared out. That's so awesome. Uh, in Japan, the RX-7 also benefited from its low displacement as taxes were substantially lower for vehicles with less than 1.5 liters of displacement, making it cheaper and more powerful than cars that customers would be shopping it against for that tax purpose. Pretty cool. Over here, that's why you don't really see a lot of big engine V8 uh, muscle cars over in Japan is because the displacement on those makes it very expensive to own. To really get a foothold in American markets, there was really only one thing Mazda can do. They had to go racing. Years earlier, with the release of the Mazda Cosmo, they had entered two Cosmo Sports into the 84-hour Marathon de la Route at the Nürburgring. 80 f <laughs> 84 hours. 82 hours in, one of the cars suffered an axle failure and had to withdraw from the race, unfortunately, while the second car finished in fourth place overall. That's good. The Familia Coupe line. Yeah, that's great. The Familia Coupe line, a.k.a. the RX-3, also kicked up the track. In Australia, the RX-3 placed first in this class at the 1974 and 1975 Bathurst 1000. That's awesome. And remained competitive in SCCA and IMSA events. In 1978, a Mazda RX-7 achieved the new classy Bonneville speed record of 183.904 miles per hour. That's fast. Uh, it's faster than so that cool. little car. Pretty cool. The RX-7 was right at home in IMSA races. In 1979, Mazda felt there was no better way to get attention than to enter their newest sports car in the IMSA GTU series. They took the first and second position at the 24 Hours of Daytona. Nice and they are commonly seen in podium positions in the GTU series. While they didn't take the manufacturer's championship in 1979, they returned with two more RX-7s for the next year. This time, the RX-7 won every race it competed in that season. And something, a neat little tidbit, one of these RX-7s in the IMSA series was rediscovered in Japan after being lost for 35 years, Whoa. which is pretty awesome. Yeah, it'd be cool to see that thing. Yeah, I wonder if it's all got a beard it's like <laughs> yeah it's been living on an island and yeah. it throws away your lightsaber when you hand it to him and then it drinks weird blue alien milk it's got yeah, coconuts as uh, wheels now <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's been spending its time in a hatch entering these numbers into a, a mysterious machine which is never explained what are we talking about again oh yeah uh the yeah, except Hey guys, real quick, I just want to thank our sponsor for today's episode, Manscaped, the leader in men's below the belt grooming. I know it's a goofy name, a goofy product, but I swear to you, these guys are the real deal. I love Manscaped. Manscaped is dedicating to helping you level up your full body grooming game. They just released the Shears 2.0, it's a luxury four-piece nail kit uh, with stainless steel tools includes some tweezers some rounded point scissors a uh a a fingernail trimmer and a file it's great stuff manscaped is changing the game once again with their 
Perfect Package 3.0 kit, which comes with the essential lawnmower 3.0, waterproof, cordless body hair trimmer, and uh, the Perfect Package also comes with a bunch of other stuff like uh, some liquid formulations to round out your manscaping routine. I, I've used a few other body trimmers in the past. Not afraid to say, not afraid to say that. Not ashamed. This is easily the best one that I've ever used. And I'm really glad that they're sponsoring today's episode. So get 20% off and free shipping today with code GAS20 at manscaped.com. That's code GAS20 at manscaped.com for 20% off and free shipping. You won't regret it. Anyway, after winning every single race, Mazda didn't really see having a factory team as their top priority anymore. They had they had just proven they could kick ass, and they decided just to let the independent teams have at it. And have at it, they did. Mazda RX-7 took the IMSA GTU Series Championship again in 1981. This is something that the RX-7 would do again and again and again, eventually winning the championship seven years in a row with little competition Whoa. from the other cars. In 1990, Mazda decided it wanted to up the ante a little bit. They wanted to move from GTU class to GTO. The GTO and GTU are the big boy classes, and they are differentiated purely by displacement of the engines. GTO was for grand touring cars with an engine displacement of 2.5 liters or above, while GTU was for grand touring cars with a displacement under 2.5 liters. O means over. U means under. (laughs) <laughs> okay i see what you're saying here i see what you're saying so you're saying that the 13b is a 1.3 liter engine yeah so, so it, it races under 2.5 yeah. but they're trying to go into gto which is over 2.5 james yeah. it sounds like they're going to need an engine a big boy bigger than that yeah is, it, they, is that what you're saying am i getting this right james yeah it's not they don't want to be yonder anymore they want to be oliver oh okay okay 1990 saw Mazda bringing back the RX-7 into the GTO class, as well as introducing the MX-6 into the GTU class. While the Mm. MX-6 saw the development of a three-rotor engine, the RX-7 GTO saw the implementation of the coveted four-rotor. I'm Rob Dom. (laughs) On paper, you can always get more power (laughs) out of a rotary by just adding more rotors. But in practice, nothing is ever that easy um, yeah just ask rob dom yeah good on him for sticking with it he's a great dude i met him a few years ago at a car show he's cool I like all him. the power being delivered to the wheels are being transferred through the last rotor which means you can only put as much power as the rear rotor can stand luckily with lots of research and testing mazda was able to pump out over 600 hertz and 529 newton meters of torque out of a wow. 13j Four rotor used in the GTO class. That's crazy. That's a lot man. of power. The four rotor RX7 wasn't able to take any victory in its first year, finishing third in the championship. But the next year, 1991, they came back and won the whole damn thing. 91 wasn't just a big year for Mazda and IMSA races. Mazda was going to take on Le Mans once more with their secret weapon, the 787B. Okay, now now you're talking my language. I. I I thought you're gonna. I thought you're gonna say the secret weapon was the power of friendship, but now <laughs> I see that uh, this might this might be a little more powerful. In 1991, the Le Mans committee decided it was time to change up the rules. They determined that this would be the first year where every car was forced to have a standard three and a half liter engine size. Unfortunately for other teams, that meant they were forced to use what had been an untested engine platform. The 3.5 liter engine turned out to be devastatingly unreliable for every team, and only the Peugeot team actually qualified with the 1991 spec 3.5 liter. The rules stated that companies could use their 1990 spec car if they added a 100 kilogram ballast if all else failed, which is what everyone except Peugeot ended up (laughs) doing because none of them could make the damn engine work. That's crazy. Mazda entered the 787B with its 2.6 liter rotary engine that sounded like a freaking Dragon Ball Z guy going Super Saiyan 7, hitting that final form. And for some reason, they weren't required to put the 100 kilogram ballast unlike all the other 1990 spec cars. 
It's not really clear why that was the case, but it's assumed it was because of the fact that Mazda fell way under the 3.5 liter guidelines of Group C with only 2.6 liters of displacement. But in a car that only weighed 1,800 pounds compared to the competition's 2,200, 100 kilograms definitely made a difference. Mazda had spent all their time not focusing on speed of their car, but on the reliability. In classic tortoise and hare fashion, the 787B qualified a ginormous 12 seconds behind the next car. That's a huge difference. Yeah. Even at a long course like uh, Suc de South, where Le Mans is held, Le Mans is held. Uh, that's a huge margin. But speed doesn't matter at Le Mans. Endurance does. The only real competition in this race was from the Jaguar and the Mercedes teams. The Jaguar suffered from poor handling characteristics and quickly fell behind the Mazda while the Mercedes rocketed out to the lead like Mercedes likes to do. It wasn't until later in the race that the Mercedes piloted by Michael Schumacher, you ever heard of him, <laughs> suffered a catastrophic mechanical failure and was taken out of the race, having gained over four laps on the Mazda. Wow. After 24 hours of racing, the Mazda 787B was declared the winner. During the race, the team had been so confident in its reliability that they drove the car at 100% the entire 24 hours, never giving it a break. The R26B four-rotor engine was in such great shape at the end of the race that it could have reportedly gone another 24 hours if, with only an oil change. Well, they should take it to the 80,000 hours of Nürburgring. <laughs> Mazda had initially started competing in Le Mans in 1974, and after 17 years, they finally achieved their first victory, making them the first Japanese car maker to ever win there. They would hold that title until Toyota's victory in 2018 and 2019. Uh, victory at Le Mans also brought Mazda their very own Triple Crown title, as they had now won the 24 hours of Le Mans, 24 hours of Daytona, and the 12 hours of Sebring. But it wasn't the 787B that won all of these. Actually, the 787B was shockingly uncompetitive at the time. Of 23 races it entered that year, it only managed to win one, and that was Le Mans. That's like losing all your freaking games and then winning the Super Bowl. <laughs> If it wasn't <laughs> for the rule change, the 787B never would have won. The next year, rotary engines were banned from Le Mans as part of their plan to standardize everyone to a single style and size engine. Uh, that's, I mean, I, okay. I get why they did this because otherwise like spending would really be the determining factor, I think. And like who would win because, you know, if you have the most money, you can develop the best engine. But I think it's whack that they, de that they, banned rotaries you know it always whenever things get banned i always just imagine elaine prost like behind the scenes even if it's not a race he's involved in he's like <laughs> oh that's not good uh they're winning too much uh please make a rule against them i don't you know the rotary one i think maybe next year we don't uh do rotaries next year maybe i don't know i think that's a good rule Alain. you guys are so hard on him now, as the company basked in the glory of its win at Le Mans, it began selling the third generation of the Mazda RX-7. Ooh, the, R the FD. This car featured an innovative sequential turbo system that was designed with the help from Hitachi. What does Hitachi make? TVs. Everything. Everything, yeah. They're one of those big old companies. Honda drove one in Tokyo Drift, so you know it had to be fast. He was the coolest guy. He's always eating chips. <laughs> This was the first... Sun Kang, cool guy. Sun Kang, cool guy. What if they showed his donut. steering wheel and it's just so greasy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Helps you drift better because you're not like gripping yeah. the wheel yeah. so hard. This was the first ever mass-produced sequential turbo system uh, ever. So that's cool. Unfortunately, the car came at a pretty bad time for Mazda. The economic bubble had just burst in Japan and it was entering the worst recession the country had ever seen. The entire event is known as the lost decade of Japan. Mazda sales Ooh. dropped. People who were once buying sports cars for their kids like it was nothing were now worried that they were still going to have a place to live. And while the RX-7 FD was a commercial success, selling nearly 69,000 units, nice, in its 11-year run, <laughs> uh, they had to pull the plug on the project in 2002 due to yet another economic downturn. I don't understand the buying it for their kids thing. 
Well, remember in our Midnight Club um, episode and our our two parter on that, it was just like these cars were so cheap because everyone was making so much money, and their car like if your kid needs a car, why not just get them the most expensive, fastest car you can? Because it doesn't it's it it's it was fine. Things were great in Japan. Well, for the time being, the rotary was dead. Mazda had long pulled rotaries from all of their cars except for the more niche sports cars due to the financial strain a fleet of rotaries would put on the company. But as we mentioned earlier with Operation Phoenix, Mazda was no stranger to rising from the ashes with its rotaries. And in 2003, only one year after being declared dead, the Renesis engine was created. Renesis is the combination of two words, re as in restart and nesis as in genesis. So restart genesis oh it's like start it's like a a message to phil collins (laughs) yeah (laughs) (laughs) they're like please phil we love your solo work but the band the band phil (laughs) i just realized that his first name is like a drum term too oh wow drum phil oh my god dude whoa (laughs) we are all just stardust <laughs> uh yeah, so uh that's the exactly starting from the beginning, restarting from the beginning, that's exactly what Mazda hoped to accomplish. The 250 horsepower naturally aspirated engine could make almost the same amount of power as the Turbo 13B, which made about 275. The Renesis engine was first used in the 2003 Mazda RX-8, a four-door descendant. I would say it's like two and a half door. Ish. Those little back doors are like little baby doors. Technically, they're four door, I guess. But anyway, uh, descendant of the RX-7, which was meant to, quote, comfortably seat four while still having the same excitement and appeal of the previous rotary engines. Uh, you know, if you ask the rotary heads, though, the Renesis is uh, not the one to get. Yeah. The RX-8 suffered from plenty of reliability issues, ironically, regarding the rotary engine. A lot of the issues stemmed from the fact that the rotaries had just sort of fallen out of fashion and plenty of people were driving them incorrectly. Some people didn't even know that their car had the rotary to begin with. Rotary engines require the occasional hard driving to make sure everything is clean and functional, yet Craigslist ads pop up all the time that say, quote, grandma owned and barely driven, which is basically the fastest way to know the rotary inside is probably ruined. It's a good point, actually. Yeah. While Mazda claims that the RX-8 ushered in a renaissance for the rotary engine, it's kind of hard to believe when you look at the legacy those cars have left behind. They should have called it the Renaissance. Do you think that anyone has an RX-7 meetup called the Renaissance Fair? Renaissance Fair? Uh, the, I hope the so. The Renaissance Fair? Renaissance? Yeah, the Renaissance Fair. Um, no, I don't think anyone has that. Hmm. This <laughs> summer... It's the Matthew McConaughey Renaissance Fair <laughs> at Toyota Thon. <laughs> All right, so the RX-7 sold an average of an average of thirty-three thousand, almost thirty-four thousand cars a year over its twenty-four-year production run, while the RX-8 only sold about twenty-one thousand units yearly over its nine-year run. That's not good. And while that doesn't exactly speak to the quality of the car, it does speak for the popularity of it. Rotary engines fell out of style, with people who really wanted a rotary going back and buying a used RX-7 instead and tricking it out to be just like their idols from Initial D or Fast and Furious, or if I get an RX-7, my idol is my friend Aaron Parker. Since then, Mazda has decided to dedicate the rotary towards more innovative endeavors. In the early 1990s, Mazda began experimenting with hydrogen-powered cars. After early experimentation with a hydrogen-powered rotary MX-5, they released the Mazda RX-8 Hydrogen RE in 2003. And in 2005, it actually received road approval. The coolest thing about running in hydrogen-only mode is that it has no emissions. And unfortunately, that's about the last cool thing. I mean, it has, isn't it water? It has to have some emissions. Yeah, that's true, but you know, would you rather be farting hydrocarbons or water, Joe? That's what I ask you. Ew, I would water, love to be doing... farting water. Don't. <laughs> no, <tempt> farting <laughs> water is diarrhea. <laughs> no, that's just getting rid of extra water with force. 
Oh man. Uh, yeah. So anyway, that was kind of the only interesting about thing about the car. Um, on paper, hydrogen has about three times the energy of the energy density rather of gasoline, which is pretty cool. But in practice, it actually only has about half of the energy density of gasoline when the weight of the storage container is taken into account. That combined with the hydrogen's propensity to explode when it comes into contact with air meant that it, you know, that's just a bad time. <laughs> I mean, and, uh, uh, hydrogen cars might have to wait a little while. A little, uh, oh, the humanity over here, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, a little, uh, oh, the humanity. I'm just saying. <laughs> oh, uh, Heisen, Heisenberg. Uh, a little, you know uh, what I'm boom goes the uh, dynamite. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to make light of the that tragedy. No, it's a horrible tragedy. Uh, you know, still thinking about it. Every day. Didn't Led Zeppelin use it as a cover or something like that? Yeah. Cover art? Uh-huh. That's in, that's in poor taste. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but innovation is innovation, and technology must always keep moving forward. For a short time, you could lease a hydrogen-powered Mazda in Japan. The dual fuel system allowed for use of both hydrogen and traditional fuel sources, but the hydrogen-powered variant only had about 109 horsepower and only 60 miles of range in hydrogen-only mode. So, whatever. In 20, 20- I mean, around town, that's probably not bad. Yeah. In 2013, a compact form of the rotary returned in the Mazda 2 EV. The rotary served Mm. as an experimental range extender, allowing the EV to run 400 kilometers before needing a charge. (laughs) That's the last time Mazda has officially done anything with the rotary engine, but it's probably not the last time we'll get to see a rotary on the road. Mazda has promised for years now that we would soon see the rotary return as a range extender in electric cars, While it's not the most fun use of a rotary engine by far, it certainly is the most practical. Their small size, smoothness, and lower number of moving parts make them ideal for the job. That actually makes a lot of sense. Until then, all we have left is their memory and the countless projects people are doing to keep that memory alive. Uh, You know, YouTube channels such as Rob Doms and other enthusiasts are making sure that performance rotaries stick around for a long time. Same with our buddy, the aforementioned Aaron Parker and his awesome RX-7. The rotary engine started as a failure and lived most of its life barely able to keep up with traditional engines in consumers' eyes. But when it came to racing, nothing could beat the rotary. And while we don't know when the next actual rotary will be seen on the Mazda showroom floor, with each announcement from the company, we get more excited that the next one will be the return of the legendary spinning Dorito that we all well, know we finally and got love. a Dorito reference in there. Yep, got to. We made a verbal commitment not to overuse it, and I'm glad that it was only the final s- sentence. Yeah, a lot of people are going to be in the comments like, uh, "Why aren't you calling it Dorito? You guys are <laughs> truly not Dorito heads if you're not calling it a Dorito." <laughs> I mean, at this point, I will take a Bugles reference. <laughs> it's an isosceles triangle, but a triangle nonetheless. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I love bugles. Do you ever put them on your fingers and eat them off your fingers? I used to. I pretend to be Freddy Krueger and 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 uh, prowl outside my neighbor's windows. <laughs> I did when I was a kid. My fingers are too big now. You can't fit your finger <laughs> in a bugle. I mean, the instrument. I'm sure I could, but not the little chip. <laughs> Well, thank you guys so much for listening or watching the PassCast podcast. Uh, if you liked this and you haven't already, go give us a subscribe on our YouTube channel, Donut Media. Um, you want some cool donut merch, you'd like it that much, go to donutmedia.com, pick yourself up some. Follow Nolan uh, on Instagram at Nolan J. Sykes. Also Twitter, follow thank Joe you. on Instagram and Twitter at, at Joe G. Weber. Follow me at James Pumphrey. Follow Donut on everything at Donut Media. Um, what do we got next week, Nolan? Uh, I don't have much schedule. Oh, we're doing Isle of sure. Man. Oh, next week is. Oh, yeah. Next week we're doing part one of our two-part series on the Isle of Man. Super right. fast, scary, treacherous race island. Tourist trophy. Uh, yeah, it's kind of like Dana White's Fight <laughs> Island, but for racing. <laughs> um, all right, guys. Take care. We'll see you next week.